Welcome everyone. This is Nazi Shataula from Lahore, hosting Adila Suleiman, who is in Karachi, and Rosa Maria Falvo, who is in Melbourne. I'm honored to introduce the launch of Not Everyone's Heaven, a visually stunning and profoundly moving account of the life and work of Adila Suleiman, whose career intersects between her personal art practice, academia, and activism. In the tumultuous environment of Pakistan's mega city, Karachi. In many respects, the book is the artist's homage to the city, but it is also a celebration of a new aesthetic of the urban folk that was born in the last decade of the, of the 20th century and becomes a powerful movement in the decades that follow. Um, just to give you um, a very short introduction to what Adila has been up to, uh, she studied at both the Karachi University in the International Relations Department and at the Indus Valley School of art and architecture. Um, she did, she is currently an associate professor uh, in the Department of Fine Art at Indus Valley School. And uh, currently she has been uh, on leave uh, while she's been compiling this book and working on her multiple projects. Now, when I look at her CV, uh, goodness, it would take perhaps a whole hour to go through all the places where she's had numerous solo shows, but uh, very quickly, I'll run through some of the places where she has been exhibiting her work. And they range from Dubai to New York, to Hong Kong, uh, to Milan, to London, to Manchester, and of course, in her own city of um, Karachi at both the Canvas Gallery as well as uh, at the Gandhara Art Space. Um, uh, this is where she's held most of her um, solo exhibitions and she has taken part in many, many group exhibitions as well in notable museums and foundations, um, including the Art Gallery in, the new, in, in Sydney, in, uh, in Australia, in Perth, at the Manchester Art Gallery, uh, at the Singapore Art Museum, at the Devi Art Foundation, at the Asia Society Museum in New York, and the National Gallery of Indonesia, and uh, in Kassel in Germany, at uh, the National Art Gallery in Islamabad, and a, in the 4A Center for Contemporary Asian Art in Sydney. She's also participated in two editions of the Karachi Biennale in 2017 and 2019. Uh, in the Singapore uh, Biennale, at the Asian Art Biennale in Taiwan, at the Sea Triennale in Jakarta, Indonesia, at the Asia Triennale in Manchester, and in the second Fukuoka Asian Art Triennale in Japan in 2002. So I'm going to, after that exhaustive list of uh, places where Adila has shown her work, I'll move on to Rosa, our dear friend, Rosa Maria Falvo, uh, who is an independent writer and curator. She specializes in Asia Pacific and Middle Eastern contemporary art, as well as um, an international commissions editor and publishing consultant in Milan, in Italy. Um, she is Italian Australian, and she works between uh, both Italy and Australia. And currently she's in Australia looking after her parents during this period of COVID. Um, 
looking after me, by the way. <laughs> Sorry? They're also looking after me. And they're also looking after her. <laughs> she has studied both in Australia and in, in Italy at Perugia University. And she's been based in Milan for many, many years now. Um, she has published many essays and edited many books. Um, she has written on literature, photography, contemporary art, design, and architecture. And she's traveled throughout the world, working very closely with artists, making many, many friends. She's worked with writers. She's worked in galleries, with collectors, with foundations, with corporations, and on the on and other institutions on the ideation, production, and promotion of books, exhibition projects, and private collections. Rosa collaborates with many international artists and organizations. And this uh, book launch is one of her most recent collaborations. She has been a special guest presenter at numerous venues, again, across the world, um, from Dhaka, the Dhaka Art Summit, to, uh, to the Prince Klaus Funds Award in Amsterdam, to Oxford University, uh, um, to Singapore, to Jeddah, to Art Dubai. And she is also, uh, importantly, is a regular guest at the annual Prince Klaus Awards uh, ceremony in Amsterdam and on the board of Vassal Artists Association in Pakistan. She is especially interested in the power of the arts as vehicles for cultural education and international collaboration. So I'm going to first address the first question to Rosa and ask her how this book came about, Rosa. And it must have been quite a daunting task during COVID times, especially since you were in Australia and the book was in production in Italy. Can you tell us yes. about it? Well, I think uh, we've been fantasizing about doing monographs for Pakistan for a long time, or at least I have. And I've discussed with many an artist about the presentation of uh, the, the talent in Pakistan to the rest of the world, because while Pakistan is well aware of its own um, capacities, I think, at, at least in, in the art circles, the rest of the world really isn't. So my first trip to Pakistan was in 2007, and that's when I met Adila and her family and many other people uh, in the art scene. And from there, it really, uh, it really piqued my interest in the country, in, the, in South Asia in general, but also specifically in the country and, and how elaborate, uh, contradictory, rich in cultural uh, interest, the whole experience was. So we, we made friends very quickly. I stayed with a dealer and her family. And I also went all over Pakistan, over land. So that was a real uh, eye opener and eye opener and an experience that I shall never forget. Uh, going by car from Karachi to Peshawar to Islamabad, Rawalpindi, Lahore, and then on to India from there, spending months at a time with each visit. And so I felt that Adila was a book in the making a long time ago, but it, it, destiny has it that it, now was the time for, for this to happen. And prior to, just prior to the, uh, the real, you know, um, momentum with the book, we had an exhibition in Milan, which is where I'm normally based, pre-COVID, uh, called Art for Education. And Adila was part of the 60 artists that were very generously part of a volunteer uh, exhibition where artworks were auctioned off and the money went to the Citizens Foundation 
which is headquartered in Karachi. So I went again to Pakistan in 2017 for both reasons, one for the Vassal Art Artists Association and the other one was to see the foundation and the various schools. And Adila generously created a beautiful artwork called The Curtain, which is something like uh, 140 centimetres by almost three metres, which is hand-beaten steel repo with um, 22 karat gold plating, which really was remarkable. And it was one of the protagonists in the, in the show, which we had in Milan. So from there, we quickly took up the discussion again about the monograph and then it began to really take effect. She needed one, she deserves one, and now she has one. And I think that it's just a flower in, in, a, in a very big garden because she's a very dynamic and uh, prolific uh, artist. So I'm very happy to be proud of part of this. Um, it covers uh, over 20 years of her work. And I've been dedicated to the arts world for about 20 years. I kind of started in 2000, really, uh, meeting artists and presenting their work. So it's the cover there that you see. There was a, a, a bit of discussion about the cover, but I think that it really does uh, not only stand out visually, but it, it kind of sums up the contradictions, the beauty, the chaos, the interest, and the, and the multi-levels that Adila deals with all along, has been dealing with in her work all along. So I'm very proud to be part of this book. I think it's the beginning of something much bigger even for a dealer, but also for the Pakistani art scene. Okay, over to you, Adila. Uh, Thank you. In, at the heart of the book is a comprehensive interview between you and Rosa. Can you mm -hmm. tell us more about how this was conducted and why did you think that this was important? And meanwhile, it would be really good if you could keep sharing your screen and showing us uh, the pages of the book as they unfold. Yeah, you can see the screen, right? It's visible to you all. Yes, it is. Yes, okay. So uh, thank you, Naji, um, uh, for a detailed introduction. I'm totally honored and humbled. Uh, and uh, it was a complete pleasure to work with Rosa. And I think uh, the conversation uh, was the culmination of our friendship and knowing each other for two th from 2007. And we had multiple discussions that every time that we were meeting, every time that we were seeing each other in different countries. And, um, and I think that conversation actually ended with this, uh, you know, eight, nine page uh, conversation uh, turned into an interview. And um, it was an exhausting um, process for both of us, I would say, as uh, both of us were asking questions. Both of us were far apart, but many Zoom meetings, phone calls, uh, email exchanges, uh, discussions, and uh, questions were changing and uh, reshaping. Answers were changing and reshaping as uh, we moved along. And um, uh, Rosa very patiently was actually reflecting on what I was replying on and uh, posing more questions. Um, and uh, I think a time came that when, when both of us uh, were exhausted and our patience ran out, uh, but uh, we didn't give up, uh, both of us. And um, so the, the, uh, I think what Rosa did with the conversation was that she was not just looking at my artwork, but she was actually looking at my life as a whole, as a person that I am. Uh, the background that I have, the upbringing that I have been gone through, uh, the challenges that I face, uh, the life, the married life that I have with my husband and with my children, my contribution as a teacher, as a person who has been working with the community, also running as uh, an organization, uh, you know, Russell for so long. So she was just not interested in my work. She was actually interested for the kind of person that I am. And, the, and, and I think the responses and the questions were based on that. 
and and that made me um, um, uh, you know that really provoked me in terms of to think um, more uh, to think deeper that why i do what i do uh, and uh, i think that she managed uh, to do that well i am so excited by this whole conversation sorry rosa uh, because i i felt that i mean i know adila and of course i know her work but it was this conversation which gave this other dimension uh, this was this this wonderful dimension really in which which you get uh, you know the multiple aspects of um, adila's art practice her life her origins and where she is centered in karachi what that means to her how she set up her studio how she conducts the art uh, vasal um, 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 organization and of course her own teaching and um, the development of that uh, art department at the Nash at the indus valley school which mm -hmm. i had seen it has grown um, uh, you know exponentially uh because it was actually re really rather small in the, in the first decade and today it is a thriving fl flourishing uh department and uh i think adila's contribution to that is enormous um but i would like to uh ask you rosa uh, more about the choice of the writers for the book and what do you think was their particular role because you've selected certain writers um and i'm sure that you thought about why you felt that they were important uh to be their uh, writing to be included in this book yes well i think the, the the original concept i i imagined it to be like uh unpeeling uh, an orange or um uh, opening up an, an onion where uh externally you have people that can talk about where the artist is coming from and the cultural context then you have people that can talk about the practice itself and the the artworks as products and getting into our conversation that was like at at the core of the book i think which was all about the artist and the voice the personal voice of the artist so that's why the conversation focused on a personal perspective the psychological uh and the the family uh context and the artist's mission the evolution of her of her relationship with her own work the person behind the art which then creates a bright product of the art in terms of the other writers uh salima hashmi we all know uh is able to uh very well construct or describe the art scene in not only in south asia but and other places but specifically in pakistan and we looked at salima's contribution to do exactly what it purports to do which is provide frames within frames where a dealer's work emerged from and uh, as a scholar and an arts educator an artist herself and a cultural practitioner um salima provided the framework for the artist within the art scene uh then we moved on to the idea of the socio political perspective and how that contextualizes adila's work because she obviously looks at individual metaphors and they become much larger concepts and much greater uh, comments on society in general so we asked hamid haroon to do his essay on art as an urban as a form of urban resistance and that contextualizes the country's projection of itself to itself because as the uh, 
as a media uh, person, the CEO of Dawn and also uh, a journalist, a collector and an art connoisseur looking at what the art can is saying within the country, but also how Pakistan is projecting itself to the rest of the world. So we felt that that was a very important context too for setting up a presentation of a dealer's work. And then Kudus provided a critique about the themes about death, migration, and the role of women in a dealer's work. And that kind of presentation was about the practice, about the development and the style of the artworks. And then we come to the conversation which becomes the artist speaking herself about what she feels she's doing. So those layers, I think are well represented in the book and they unpacked what, what a dealer's work is all about. Of course, the people that I mentioned are leaders in not only in the arts and in the, and in the cultural world of Pakistan, but also in the life and in the cities that uh, are focused in the book. The last chapter we will go on to discuss brought new voices into, uh, into the book, which were a great surprise to all of us. <laughs> Uh, not only because of the context of, of the last chapter, but also because we were going about to go into print. So all of a sudden we had something else that was very, very big and uh, inevitably part of the book. And so we'll talk about those people later on. But uh, I think those voices that, we're, that we've chosen have all enriched what, what a dealer has to say. And, and then she says it herself uh, in our conversation. So I thank them for their contributions. They were very generous in their time and their efforts and really tried to pinpoint what a dealer is trying to do. I'll move to you and ask you uh, if you can talk about your experience um, of working in collaboration with a variety of craftsmen in Karachi. Mm -hmm. And why did you create your own studio and workshop? Uh, how have you trained uh, such a huge number of urban practitioners? And how did this impact their own practices? So uh, Nadi, before I answer your question, I just want to add to the contributors who have written that uh, Kudus and Hamid, I would say that they're their friends, but they are also my harshest critics. And they, they, are, you know, they tell you the brutal truth uh, in, in one line, just one comment, and I would question it for myself. You know, I will, I will have sleepless nights. Um, you know, with their one comment, they don't have to write articles. So Kudus and uh, Hamid has that power. And I think to have them, um, because they understand my work so much uh, and because they can comment on it, I think I was also extremely happy to have their essays uh, in, in the book. As for your um, uh, second question, I think... Um, uh, the relationship with the craft people started while I was at uh, Indus Valley doing my bachelor's degree. And since my second year, I have been um, looking outside my studio space rather than, uh, you know, inside and introvert inspection. And that, uh, I think that sensibility came from my um, exposure to the Karachi University from where I did my master's before coming to the art school. One, that I was a mature student at the art school. Two, that the Karachi University really made me understand what Karachi is. Though I'm a complete Karachiite since my birth, I used to live in, uh, in a you know humble area uh, with humble resources and I, I knew the challenges. But Karachi University really made me realize what 
Karachiites go through. And that opened up the entire city uh, to me um, uh, without fear. And, and I started exploring, looking things that were avail already available outside and with, with whom I can collaborate. Um, and um, looking at found objects, looking at um, found techniques, found images, found stories, uh, which is still part of my life up till now. And working uh, under uh, David, David Ellsworth, and getting uh, some uh, knowledge from Durya, or uh, looking at how they were working, look, seeing how uh, things were, uh, they were not constrained. So what David and Durya did for, for me, I would say that they opened up the art world to me, that anything and everything is possible. So that cliched, you know, conventional art making practice, which, uh, uh, you know, one, one would say that that would be the right way to go about my instant response uh, to their to the, that opening was to just go wild out and 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 explore. And uh, that, um, and I, uh, right now, the studio that I have was uh, simply because that I had a studio at home and I was making so much noise that my father-in-law said that either you ship, uh, you ship the studio out or you ship out. That was the kind of, uh, you know, uh, situation in terms of, uh, he was very calm because I always had the studio at home and I was working with material which was making a lot of noise. The um, welding was was jolting the entire house you know there was this buzz in the entire house every time i welded so uh, then i started looking at for a space with my father and i found this uh, really nice uh, cute little house where i shifted and then the work started getting bigger i moved to uh, to a bigger place uh, but the relationship with the craft people was um, initially uh, was quite uh, tolling and was quite challenging because we live in a male chauvinistic uh, society and um, uh, instruction coming from a woman uh, and getting it done uh, was a challenge for me um, to make them understand why and because the question was why are you making this why what what good it will do to the society how it's going to save me what, what why are you making these helmets because all all the the first project after in this valley was uh, Salma Sitara and sister motorcycle workshop where I was working with the craft people you know the the, the repuse uh, team I had uh, the painters I had uh, the mirror work and they all had this question if these helmets are not going to provide any safety to the women, why are you making them? What difference, you know, what good it will do? And 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 to make them understand that that this is not about providing it is this is about raising an issue, it is about look, making people understand that they, there is another side of the story as well. And they slowly and gradually for the last 23 years, I think the relationship has developed to the extent that. Now they call me Ustad and I call them Ustad. And, and, and for me to get things done, because they used to tell me that this is the right way to do it. And I used to tell me, no, this is not the right way to do it. We are going to do it another way because that's the kind of uh, result I want. And I used to sit in their studio spaces in uh, Pital Gali and, uh, uh, you know, behind Bandar Road in front of the poem. Uh, Pakistan uh, radio station uh, and get my things done and sit in their studio and make it and give it to them. When I started doing that only then the relationship flipped and this and they understood that I knew what I was talking about and since then touch wood I have been extremely lucky for the kind of people that I found in the city they're extremely respectful. I am, you know, I try my level best to be respectful to them. And and to it, it's a large, big family of now more than 30 people uh, working together for one cause. And they all take ownership to that. And they're all very proud participants of this whole process. And, um, and they advise me and I learned so much from them. And they learned uh, from me, from the, you know, the... Uh, uh, upbringing that I had um, and also the learning that I had at Karachi, uh, Karachi University and at Indus Valley. So it's it's a joint collaborative project now, which is, I call it sometimes, I laugh and I say it's a factory that I'm going to, uh, but it is turning into a space. I just extended my space because there was no space to make the a new work that I'm doing with embroidery. There was no space to make them sit, so I extended the entire floor, created a false floor, 
So it's growing uh, every day. So sometimes I wonder whether you have any quiet space. Where do you read and think and draw? Uh, yeah, uh, I've been to your studio workshop and uh, mm -hmm. I don't think it's possible for you to do any of that. Uh, so where's your quiet time? So my quiet time is at home and early in the morning. Uh, and I get up really early around 4.30. Today I got up at 4.30 and uh, I do my walking and at the rooftop. Uh, we have a really nice basement uh, library, so I work there. Uh, traveling is one thing that I thoroughly enjoy and traveling is my quiet time because I'm alone and I carry all my sketchbooks with me, uh, all the reading with me. Uh, so traveling really helps me because uh, that is my alone me time where I'm just reading and drawing and, um, you know, thinking about other projects, trying to resolve my, uh, you know, my thought process in terms of what I want to say and also in terms of the material that I want to explore. So, Rosa, I think we should come to uh, the last chapter in the book. Yes. Uh, uh, Killing Fields of Karachi. Uh, it's a chilling title. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, I would really like you to talk about this chapter and uh, about this particular project uh, because it is a tremendous, a great climax uh, to this wonderful monograph. Um, do you believe that this is a turning point in um, Adila's artistic journey? Because I think that it is uh, something, uh, um, a wonderful direction that has come about. I mean, it's not something that she planned, but it is something which is, uh, I think these 20 years of the way that she has worked, the images that she has worked with, the historical references that are part of her work uh, as a sculptor. And, um, and then we come uh, to this Karachi Biennale uh, where Adila puts together this extremely ambitious project uh, moving from her sculptural practice into something which uh, seems to incorporate many, many different aspects of art making. And uh, I'd really like you to talk about uh, where you, uh, about this and where you think, uh, where you think she is positioned as an artist and what are your responses to this work and why you thought, I know that it's coming right at the end, but how did you, did you delay the project in order to incorporate, uh, the, did you delay the production of the book in order to incorporate this particular project? Or were you really, I was extremely uh, overcome by uh, what I experienced um, of the project. Yes. Um, yeah. Well, we, we went into a panic basically because uh, the, the book was ready to be uh, finalized in terms of the, the production side. And then I was watching and waiting and and then we what happened was a surprise to all of us and so it was it was quite uh, shocking to see what was going on and how to quickly go back and and do something about it in terms of the production of the book it had to be part of the book that that was Un unquestionable. It also put us into a difficult position about halting everything and waiting for, for the material to be reorganized. And in retrospect, there's, there's uh, this thing was, this chapter was really the best thing that could have happened to the book in a way, because it's a culmination of everything that the book is all about. We were talking about the various layers and then there was a, a literal life, life experience that covered all the areas at once from the art scene to the socio-political context 
to the artworks themselves, the new ones, and then the artist and her life. So everything that we had been talking about came into vivid display in a, in a theatrical way and also in a, a literary way. So I think that this chapter literally culminates everything that Adela's work is about. And it has, I think, pivoted her towards another kind of um, form, the documentary style form, not just in film, but also in her perspective, in her artwork perspective, where you're using history, you're using lived experience, you're using memory, perception, and uh, real life or, or live uh, interpretations of, of what has happened in the past and also what is happening now to tell a new story about where we're at, where we're at not just in Pakistan but in the rest of the world because my first impressions of Pakistan were I think and now they're coming back to me more vividly about how it can it, it looked very chaotic and it looked extremely exciting and with great potential but it also looked like a, a a situation that was very precarious and really all those things apply to every political scene and there's no uh, there's no doubt that what's happened since since the publication of the book and the the pandemic and where we are today um, in february 21 shows that we, we are all uh, quite in the same boat, to, um, to quote a, a cliche. The fact that there are extremes in the world is, is obvious, but it's what we're doing with those extremes. And I think that uh, Adela's work, especially this killing field, shows all those landscapes, the, the emotional ones and the psychological ones, the social landscapes, what she calls the ecology of, of people and human existence really, and our coexistence, they're all coming to the fore in that piece of work and also in the presentation of that, of that chapter that was could not be Adina, denied. I, I really would like you to talk a little bit about the experience of this, uh, of this project because uh, you know you planned it in a particular way, the need for making it uh, and putting it out, that's one aspect of it. But then the, the whole performative uh, aspect, which I don't know whether you really thought about that side of it. And see, things seem to have unfolded, um, Adila, for, uh, for people, uh, for many, many people who experienced viewing this, this particular project in a way which was uh, unexpected and uh, surprising and uh, meaningful. Um, uh, would you like to just talk about that a bit? What it meant for you and how you think, how you think that this has given you another direction uh, in which you, uh, which possibly you are going to follow or is it, a, how is it a turning point? So um, uh, if somebody knows me and somebody who has seen my practice would understand uh, what I did um, uh, for, for, for the show. Um, uh, I have been, when you are given larger than life things, what do you do with them? When you experience uh, death, uh, what, what do you do then? Uh, how do you respond to it? And, and uh, you know, I always question uh, in terms of uh, artists being uh, selfish because we see someone else's misery um, and we always, uh, you know, our mind starts working that how we can utilize that and turn it into a visual. And that's, that's in perspective, like that's a constant check that I keep on myself. Um, this was one of the uh, stories that I, uh, you know, we, we experienced as a city, as a country, the whole world knows about it. But there are uh, events in the past, like the, you know, uh, the four policemen being killed uh, in Vana, 
uh, in North Waziristan where they were uh, the perpetrators were playing football out of the heads of the uh, of the policemen and I got that real footage and uh, for for months for months I couldn't respond to it I I was dreaming about it I didn't know what to do with it but I experienced that and I got the first hand information and I uh, focused on on the act that was happening, which was playing the football rather than what happened around, and the pleasure that was that it was providing uh, to the perpetrators. And I only took out the sound of uh, of the laugh that the one of the per person was laughing while playing, and they were passing these very normal comments that one would pass, uh, you know, in terms of playing football, that, my, you know, hit kick harder, it's not reaching me. And they were doing that with a human head. So what do you do then? You you die uh, yourself inside a bit. Uh, you you don't know how to respond to it. You, you can only uh, be wary of the fact that this should not be repeated. And it should be it should turn into a memorial or a monument which make people realize that they cannot repeat this ever again. And and same happened with the Baldia factory fire. Same happened with the Vana. And I think same happened with uh, uh, with Nakibullah's death. That uh, that 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 boy who came to this merciless city uh, trying to make his career how his life changed forever and his family's life changed forever and how a father uh, you know fought for justice uh, in a country like pakistan and and even uh, when you are standing with the narrative that state has knitted for you even when you stand with the state even then as an artist you will be censored or any person who raises these concerns because what they want is that they don't want our thinking to be changed. They want a certain narrative to stay with us. And the moment you try to change that narrative, they will put a full stop to that. And for me, we have experienced, you know, I'm a Zahulak generation who, who was raised uh, at the time when Zahulak was there. And, and we have seen censorship, we have seen, but we knew our boundaries. We knew exactly what can be done. Here, I think uh, the hypocrisy is such that this false facade of uh, you know that has been created uh, there's a false perception that things had become better for us and and it's such a false perception that it really jolts your mind when something happens it happens to activists it happens to writers it happens to filmmakers and every time it happens we question ourselves that oh my god we are still standing like we are where we were uh, you know 30 years ago and for, for me, uh, the eye opener was the power art has in a country. Still, it has the power that when you hear the story on the television, you read it in the main newspapers 24-7 uh, for a year from 2018 to 2019, the story was in our faces. But the moment you create a visual out of it, it is going to scare someone and then they just couldn't stand it. Within two hours it was. And all I did that I created a visual out of the story of the 444 pillars. When you lay them down on a field, what does it look like? How, you know, what, what when you will walk through the, uh, through the tombstones, what will happen to you? And I worked with, I didn't show Nakib's uh, face in the film. I didn't show, uh, you know, SSP's uh, face in the film. All I did that I was working, uh, the whole story started off with an investigative report by Dawn, by Fahim and uh, Nazia. And, uh, and the title was Killing Fields of Karachi of that investigative report. And I said to myself that I'm not going to build anything uh, anything on my own and I'm not going to put in any uh, thing that I have discovered. I'm going to use the data that is already available, the story that is already being knitted for us, the story that has been investigated. So there was not a single thing in the film that was not uh, known to journal public uh, from before. Uh, it, if you Google search it, you will see it there. It's on the television. It's on programs. If you see 2018, 2019 programs, you will see that. 
and my, and i was very cautious of that fact and all all i said that i'm going to show the pain the loss and the hopelessness faced by a person like his father and and make him sit in front of the merciless sea of karachi and make him because it's ruthless the, the city is ruthless the sea i am very scared of the sea it's ruthless because it looks beautiful the city looks beautiful but then it can just Uh, you know snap you and and you will not even know and this is exactly what happened with nakib that he was having tea with his friends on one you know gulshay khan hotel in sorabgon and he was taken from there and from january 3rd and on january 13th he he passed away he was shot dead uh, you know and and then i got the uh, images um of the of the room the location uh, the um, you know his body and i said that i can't and i i you know that the, the, those five paintings were actually the kaidazam image is from that room it was hanging that image of kaidazam was hanging in the room uh, his body was lying there and and i just had to do something about it and i had them on those four five pillars but left and right on kaid azam and he being the center that this is the kind of country that ha- that we have become and this is who we are and that's the reality and we and we are so hypocrite uh, that that we we do we know it we you know we will do something else we will write something else we will document something else and we will show the world something else that is never the real picture when you you showed it is never that we accept yes this is who we are and i think this work was about that this is what we are this is what this city can do to you and if you don't do any something about it you will be lying there beside the 444 uh, tombs and and that is what the father was you know staring in the eyes of the viewer staring maybe probably in the eyes of the perpetrator ssp asking him quietly sitting in front of the sea looking at us just staring and maybe raising the question that if you don't do anything about it this is what will happen and uh, um, so this it, it just happened it, it's not i was looking the ecology i was looking at the ecology of violence i was looking at the human ecology i was looking at how la violence can be how violence can corrupt the landscape how that site the farmhouse site has now been labeled forever it can never be seen as what a farmhouse would be seen by a normal person it will always be seen with the violence that is embedded in its uh, you know in the grounds well i do think that really it is the ecology of the city for me yeah. that is uh, what it is and uh, i would like to um, go back to Ro- rosa to uh, talk about how she thinks that this is um, you know a transformative moment in adila's um, artistic journey so i'd like you to comment on that and also to talk about um, uh, the choice of uh, mohammed hanif uh, uh, to write Uh, about this work and um, Asma Mudrawala's wonderful uh, translation of the work. Well, I think Adila has has said it well when that there is the power of art to not just express but also be a vehicle or some kind of bridge between. the human being and individual existence and also the the state of of a collective consciousness and and also a a socio political context it's that bridge between the individual and the society that art can uh unleash unfold in this case i feel that she's almost instigated uh, some kind of cathartic experience where it's released the not only the information and the memory but and and the outrage but it's also released the the grief and the feelings the sensitivity towards such a such a uh, an important and 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 an undeniable uh, fact uh, these kind of uh, things happen uh, in other places in the world and it really is I found working with 
various artists that have uh, had the courage to uh, to actually address some of these issues like not just censorship but also the ugliness the the brutality uh, the injustice in in a society there are other artists addressing these issues a dealer has quietly and in this case not so quietly but chipped away at this i the contradiction and the fact as she says about there is the beauty and then there is the other side to that there is the the what we perceive as reality and then there are people's interpretations and their various um, memories about what what has happened and her art has i think evolved into at first it, it seems that it was like emblematic telling uh, and symbol symbolizing these things now i think it's evolved into a literal theatrical presentation of these things using history and using uh, visual and uh, visual facts that she makes with her work through film through through storytelling and uh, and through other artists and their perspective I think that that is a, a very interesting development to her work. It, it enlarges her work, it enlarges her perspective, and it has more impact for the group that she's in, that she, the people that she educates, the people that uh, understand her work, and those who don't understand her work. In fact, it's even more important to be talking to those who don't understand uh, and not so much teaching anybody anything, but more like asking them how authentic it is in their view, in their memory, in their perception, in their understanding to enlarge, and enlarge their understanding. And I think that's what some of the best teachers can do they're not it's not about preaching it's not about uh, moralizing it's about uh, metabolizing the information and then making something else out of it according to what what how we perceive things as far as the the other writers <coughs> the other artists are concerned uh, having a perspective from a pack from an ex-Pakistani uh, Pakistan, army perspective, the institutionalized perspective is precious. And I think what he's written there is, is, uh, is undeniably, you know, it speaks to everyone uh, above and beyond uh, the various uh, political standpoints, etc. It speaks from the heart and it tells, and, and literally the, the comment is, uh, at least we agree on the definition of non-art. And I think that kind of sums up the fact that if you talk about violence, then people might say, it's not about art. You're, you're terrorizing the audience. You're trying to shock us, or you're trying to provoke us. And that's outrageous. And of course, I'll have to censor that or I'll have to reject that because I don't like that. I don't like looking at that. Uh, perhaps art's role is not that for, for some people. Perhaps art's role is to um, appease and to uh, sort of uh, smooth away uh, some of the ugliness. Others would argue that art's role is literally to do what a dealer has done, which is put it in front of us. It's a very brave thing to do. Uh, and it's very brave that these people have written about it as well, that, that they have, they've gone out on a limb to say what they say in this book. Uh, I would like to read a little bit from the introduction of uh, Hanif's it's a little preface. 
that goes before the actual chapter. And it quotes uh, Kafka, this morning I watched the destruction of the world as an attentive spectator, and then I got back to work. I think uh, not only has Adela addressed all these issues, but the fact that the other artists, the other writers, the, com the community itself in Pakistan, the art community, and by default also the audience has had to address these issues. I think these issues are one of the most important that we have to deal with. Conflict resolution uh, and not just environmental factors from a natural point of view, but also from a psychological and a social point of view. So this chapter, I think, is a very important one. Uh, the, the, the paintings that go with it and, and the visuals here uh, speak for themselves. And it, it's, it's a quite an extraordinary development. I think it's going to pivot her work and also the work of other artists in Pakistan. I do. Well, I believe that it, it, it really is a turning point and um, I'm really looking forward to what is going to happen uh, now with uh, Adila's work and with all the many, many people who uh, come into contact with her. And I'm sure that it gives a lot of strength to other artists and to her students and certainly to people such as myself. Uh, one feels inspired uh, by her endeavor and uh, one applauds it and celebrates it. Um, and I think that we've almost come to the end of uh, our conversation. Uh, so I really would like to thank uh, you, uh, Rosa, and you, Adila, for having thank participated so today uh, on a Sunday. And we are, we are uh, really, I'm really fortunate that we are able to communicate across all these continents that we inhabit. And we hope that we will meet in person um, uh, soon. And um, we, I look forward to that very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you so much, much Nazesh. And thank you, LLF. And thank you, Nazesh, for you know, asking the question, the poking questions. Uh, you know, you really read, she read our conversation, uh, the whole thing, the whole chapters and everything. Thank you for doing that. It was a, it was my pleasure. This has been a really wonderful uh, experience for me to go through the book, and uh, I'm sure that it'll reach many many people and it'll inspire its readers. Thank you all, and thank you, thank you. LLF.